can I, um, can, can, can I say, first of all, what a, a real pleasure it is to be here this morning to pay tribute uh, to Christian Aid. Uh, as we've just heard, uh, started in 1945 as Interchurch Aid. Christian Aid Week started in 1957. So a idea that you can help people through people of faith throughout the world that started as a campaign is now a movement and I would say that Christian Aid is now one of the great British national institutions uh, that is acknowledged throughout the whole country. You know, we sometimes say the first 500 years in every British institution's history is always the most difficult, but Christian Aid has achieved a, a reputation and acknowledgement by the public after no more than uh, 60 years. A great achievement indeed. And you will find that throughout the country this week, uh, 10,000 churches are involved, 50,000 people involved in collecting, and it's an enormous achievement. And it shows that social movements that bring about change are built on moral foundations. And some of the greatest social changes we've achieved in history, from the abolition of slavery right through to debt relief, uh, to help for Africa, uh, to all that is done to help against maternal and infant mortality. So much of it is achieved by people of faith and vision who have decided uh, that they do feel the pain of others and they do believe in something bigger than ourselves. And as someone who is a former finance minister, I can only uh, uh, glory at the fact that uh, Christian Aid started by raising 26,000 in its first year. And now it could raise nearly 10 million this year. And I think that's a 4,000% increase, which is more than uh, inflation uh, has brought about in these, uh, in, 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 these, in these years. And I've got a very personal interest in, uh, in, in Christian Aid because uh, I will always remember the mountain of red envelopes that were, my mother uh, uh, was responsible for not only to deliver, which we had to do, and then collect. I'm not sure she trusted us to collect, to collect the money uh, every a week. And so many of you here and so many of people uh, who are on social media will remember uh, that over these last uh, 60 years or so, so many uh, families have been involved in collecting money in Christian Aid Week. And I remember that when I was at the Treasury, uh, the Christian Aid ran the campaign to secure debt relief uh, and I remember getting uh, a, a Treasury official coming to me and saying, we've got this uh, letter uh, with the petition uh, from a Mrs. Brown. And she says, uh, uh, no need to reply. Uh, don't waste money on a postage stamp. <laughs> and I remember also my brother uh, running a newspaper to raise money for uh, the, the, uh, what was then called the Freedom for Hunger campaign. Uh, and the, the few pence that uh, he raised uh, contributed to many, many people around the country raising money for freedom from hunger. And of course, my father was a, a minister of the church, and you had to be very careful if you were a minister in these days not to sound too political. And he told me of a, a friend of his who was also a minister, who if his political party won on the Sunday, he would do nothing more than announce that the first hymn was, Now Thank We All Our God. But if the opponents won, the first hymn would always be, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, forgive our foolish way. <laughs> and if by any chance, and this has become more common, some third party won, it, it was, oh, God works in mysterious ways, <laughs> his wonders uh, to, to perform. But just think of the achievements over these uh, uh, years in which Christian Aid has been in, in existence. Um, when you think of the numbers of people and children in poverty in the poorest countries, 50% of the world, 30% by 1990, down to less than 10% today. And you think of the numbers of children that were dying in the first year, it was 10 million only 30 years ago. And although it's unacceptable, it, that figure has been halved uh, in the last uh, few years. And think of maternal mortality, which is the campaign that is being run uh, for Sierra Leone this week by Christian Aid. 500,000 mothers dying in childbirth only 10 years ago, and that figure has been virtually halved. But it shows what we have achieved, but it also shows when you look at the figures of what happens now, what is still 
to be achieved. You know, when I was um, first a candidate standing for parliament, I used to put in my election literature, this constituency needs a member of parliament of youth and fresh ideas. So what did I say in my last election literature? <laughs> this constituency needs a candidate of maturity and experience. But you know, Christian aid has proved over these 60 years that you can still be full of new ideas and also be very mature in the way you deliver and talk to the people of this uh, country. And so let, let us thank Christian Aid for all the achievements it's been responsible for over these years, leading the world development movement, leading on climate change, leading on tax justice, leading on debt relief, leading on so many other issues, including on maternal mortality uh, this, this year. But I'm obviously, and you are obviously, interested not in what we've done, but what we still have to do. Uh, not what's been achieved, although it's been very important, but how in this world today, we've got so many problems that have still got to be fully addressed. And I have in my head three figures that shock me. That even in 2030, the year that we promised we will achieve the sustainable development goals, that means that every child will be at school, a promise that there will be no, avo no uh, unavoidable uh, deaths uh, of children in, uh, as infants, that we will have dramatically reduced maternal mortality. What do we find according to the latest evidence? Three million children will still be dying before the age of one. That's 10,000 children a day. We find that 300 million children will still be in poverty. And in the most abject and most extreme poverty, despite our promise that we would achieve the abolition of extreme poverty. And in my area, education, we find that even in 2030, after all we're trying to do, there'll still be 200 million children who will not be going to school tomorrow or any other day. There will be 400 million children who will be leaving school at the age of 11, never to go back into education, and therefore never to have qualifications that are of any use to them in the workforce. And in 2030, there will still be 800 million of our children, 800 million, half the children of the developing world who will leave school early without qualifications, without the ability to use what they learn at school to get some job or some employment and some income from their skills in the workforce. You know, and when you look at the numbers of children in conflict, 40 conflicts and more, we now have a world where there are 30 million children displaced, more than the populations of most countries, and there are 10 million child refugees, all of them denied not only uh, freedom from poverty, but the chance of education and certainly the chance of good health. You know, I sometimes tell the story about Rwanda in 1995 during the genocide, because if you go to the Rwanda Children's Museum, that is the museum of the genocide in Kigala, you will find a number of photographs of children. And one of these children's names is David, and I have never forgotten this. David, and you get a very small amount of information about him, but there's a photograph of this young boy and it says, David, age 10, ambition to be a doctor, favorite sport, football, favorite hobby, making people laugh. And then it says, death by mutilation. Last words, the United Nations are coming to save us. And that young man, in his innocence, in his idealism, who wanted to be a doctor, simply wanted to get an education to serve other people. His innocence, his ideas, he believed our promises that when we said we would come to help him, we would, and we never did. And that young person was denied the chance to make his contribution to the world. And we said never again after Rwanda. We said never should this happen again. And then three years ago, remember that photograph of that young boy landing on a beach in Europe his boat in which he was moving from Syria with his father capsized. The young dead body on that beach, Alan Kurdi was his, was his name. 
He was coming to Europe to get an education that he could not get because his father assessed that there was no possibility of school for him in Syria or in the countries around Syria from which he was being pushed out trying to come to get an education. We said never again, but what had changed? A young boy's life lost uh, because we could not deliver him an education. And then last summer, the Maria camp in Greece, the refugee camp, and this is almost incredible and, 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 and so uh, heinous that uh, I almost hesitate to mention it. 10, 11, 12-year-old boys reported as attempting to commit suicide. Children in a refugee camp, so devoid of hope, so full of violence at camp, nothing basic being provided for them. A camp that should either have been closed down or we should have given proper support to it, which we were trying to do and the money never got through. And these young boys, so devoid of hope. Now at the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, all your life in front of you, everything ahead of you, you should have the hope that you can actually do things and that there's a chance to make the most of yourself. But to be so devoid of hope that at that age you are contemplating and even attempting to take your own life is a commentary on how so little has changed and how so much has yet to be done. And so today I want to ask the question, why is it that uh, our commitment to international aid and to working with countries around the world to relieve poverty and to give young people education and to make sure that young people have health, why is it that we are not as successful as we should be and what can we do about it? And how can we use this week and the weeks ahead to change people's view about what needs to be done and what our responsibilities are to other people. Now, of course, some great things have been done. I was very much uh, part of the initiatives on health that I believe have made a huge, a huge difference. Um, we created an international fund for immunization, raised money in the marketplace, eight billion in total, and with the Global Alliance for Vaccination and Immunization, 500 million children have been vaccinated, and I believe that five million and more lives have been saved. We created something totally new as well, to use money more effectively, advanced market commitments it was called, to support the delivery of drugs as early as possible from the stage of development to get them into Africa and Asia so that lives could be quickly saved, and about half a million lives have been saved as a result. I'm involved in an education initiative at the moment where we're trying to make sure that we can use education aid far more effectively. So we're asking the British government and all governments for guarantees that will allow us to raise money in the marketplace so that we can use two billion of guarantees to create eight billion of money for education uh, and then have a buy down facility to have interest rates at such a low rate that we can actually put 10 billion into education as a whole create 200 million school places, the very number of school places that need to be created if every child is to be at school by 2030. So when people say, and this is the argument that is used against aid, it's wasteful, it's unproductive, it's uh, poor people in rich countries giving money that eventually just goes to rich people in poor countries, that dictators get the benefit of the money and not the people who need it, that eventually it impedes development because uh, countries take aid and subsidies and don't focus on what they need to do to reform their economies. Uh, and when people say that aid is unproductive and wasteful, and I say, look at what's happened on health, look at what's happening on education, look at one simple fact, 30 cents for the drug that is necessary for children in the poorest countries to be free from pneumonia if that is about to strike them, which could save 800,000 lives a year for 30 cents per child. So don't say that education aid, $10 per child, is too generous. Don't say that uh, spending 30 cents on a drug for pneumonia is money that is wastefully used or could be used better in some other way. And we've got to argue back against those people who say that aid is unproductive, aid is wasteful, aid is money going to the wrong people, aid is somehow inefficient 
when all the evidence is that aid is well used and aid is even more necessary if we're going to deal with fundamental problems that nobody, no decent citizen in Britain would tolerate if they saw what was happening at first hand. But I do believe that there's a more insidious argument that is developed that we've got to take on that is opposing aid and saying that somehow the climate uh, does not anymore favor international aid and indeed money coming from charities like yourself to help people in the poorest countries. Because the argument is growing that somehow we care for others in other countries more than we're caring for people in our own country. The argument is growing that somehow charity begins at home and by that people mean not the original meaning of charity begins at home which is charity is learned at home but charity should begin and should end at home. And then the argument is that what we do to help people globally instead of helping people locally is at the expense of people in our own country who need that help too. And then people quote examples like, you know, when uh, Charles Dickens wrote Bleak House, there was Mrs. Jellaby, and she was the woman that he featured in Bleak House because she could see nothing nearer, he said, than Africa and neglected her own children at the expense of some solution that she had for Africa's problems. And so what we're being told is that there is a choice. Either you can help people at home or you can help people abroad. Either you can do something globally or you can do something locally. And then there's that infamous uh, quote from the Prime Minister that sadly I have to mention today. Well, remember Mrs. Thatcher said there is no such thing as a society, only individuals. Well, Mrs. May has said something similar. There is no such thing as global citizens or citizenship, only individual states. And it's this idea that our responsibilities end either at the front gate or at the town sign or at the border of our country, and somehow we owe far less responsibility uh, for what's happening around our world. And indeed, if the choice is there, it's between them and us, and sadly, this is a mood that is developed that has got to be counteracted. Now, one of the great thinkers that the right wing in the, our country often cite is Adam Smith. And Adam Smith came from my hometown of Kirkcaldy. And Adam Smith is hailed as the patron saint of neoliberal economics by so many people. And he's said to have thought that selfishness and self-interest became a public good because that's what made the market economy work. And nothing can be further from the truth. Adam Smith believed that markets needed morals. He, made, he, meant, he said that markets did not work unless they were underpinned by moral qualities that markets could not themselves create. He was famous for the invisible hand, they said, of economics. But actually, what his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, was about was the helping hand that we had a duty to help other people. And Adam Smith did not say, as these neoliberal thinkers say, that we had only responsibilities to ourselves or to our families, or that uh, other countries were far off places of which we need know nothing. Uh, which is one famous quote. What Adam Smith said uh, was something different. And he asked this question, and it's the same question that's being asked today. He said, why, he said, why is it that I could not sleep at night if I had a cut on my small finger? But I could sleep soundly, he said, even if a million people died from an earthquake in China. And his answer was not that, uh, well, it's inevitable, that's human nature, we just care only about ourselves, or at best we care about what's happening in our own country. His answer was quite different. His answer was there is a circle of empathy, and empathy flows outwards. Empathy means putting ourselves in other people's shoes, thinking of what other people are experiencing. And that circle of empathy, he said, flows outwards from the individual and their 
connection and responsibility for the family to the local community, to the nation, and then to the world. And the more we had information, the more there was communication between peoples, and the more we had education, and the more sophistication there was of our moral sense, the more you would see that we would care not just about ourselves and our families and our community and our country, we would care about what's happening in the wider world. And so for him, the question, who is my neighbor, is answered by saying that the neighborhood is not only that local group of people that he knew so well, but the neighborhood included the whole of the wider world. Community was not some group of people that was uh, uh, just the people that were in his vicinity, but his community for him was a network of relationships that encompass people in far off countries and perhaps he was more prescient than anyone in seeing that we could connect with them eventually at the click of a switch uh, to any country, any place, any time, any, anywhere. And for him, citizenship was not some legal status uh, that came from statehood. For him, citizenship was people who were connected to the whole world and people who were prepared to say that UK aid should be used to get 10 million children as it is to school and that we should be supporting the work that is done by so many organizations that are trying to save lives like the lives of children and mothers in Sierra Leone, where, let us be honest, there are seven million people in that country, more than the population of Scotland, almost as many as the population of London, and there are only 130 doctors, less than 1,000 nurses, and only six dentists, and therefore, Adam Smith would say, our circle of empathy that flows outwards, putting ourselves in other people's shoes, understanding through information, education, and communi communication what the needs of these peoples are, that empathy, empathy would flow to the poorest citizen in the poorest and most remote part of the world, eventually as a result of understanding their plight. And of course, it raises the question then of what it is to be British. And this, I think, is at the heart of the debate that is called Brexit. Because I think it does now raise a fundamental issue. And I'll be honest, my worry is that the divisions in our country are now so deep and so pervasive that it could take a generation for us to reconcile these differences, bring people together, and find a unifying vision of our country and a sense of purpose and direction that takes us forward into the modern world. Because let us be honest, there are two visions of Britain that are competing with each other. It is not just that there is an argument about parliamentary tactics, about whether we go with the Canada option, the Switzerland option, or go with the uh, uh, Norway option, or have a WT option. It is more than that. And it's not just that Parliament is deadlocked and can't agree, it is more than that. It is that there is a fundamental disagreement about what kind of Britain we are trying to be. And unless that is resolved, it is going to be difficult to move forward. Because there is one vision of Britain that derives from people's misunderstanding of the Dunkirk spirit. This idea that we are better off when we stand alone and aloof and apart sufficient unto ourselves, isolated if necessary, uh, supposedly this independent spirit uh, that means that we are better off when we are disengaged from the world. And that, of course, is not what Dunkirk was about. Dunkirk was about us being alone out of necessity and not of choice and of Churchill trying to find the American link up that would uh, bring uh, strength to the alliance and even offering a merger with France uh, to save uh, France from Nazi control. But that's one vision of Britain. But there is a second vision of Britain that I've been talking about in the last few minutes. 
a Britain that is open, outward looking, engaged and not disengaged with the rest of the world, a Britain that is internationalist in its outlook, a Britain that sees that it has responsibilities not just to itself, but that its national interest is served, but also its moral uh, standing is served by being engaged and part of the rest of the world. And I believe that this is a choice that we have to make as a, as a country. And I cannot see how the issue of our future can be resolved unless we understand that in a modern, interdependent, interconnected, more integrated world, uh, that to be outward looking and not inward looking, to be engaged and not disengaged, uh, to be internationalist and not narrowly nationalist is the only way forward for a modern country in a, in a, modern, in a modern world. And that means two things. It means that we have got to show how we can cooperate to solve the problems of the world that we've just been talking about. And it means also that we've got to give people hope that it can be done. You know, if you look back to the 1950s and 60s, you remember that one of the great issues was the space race. America was fighting Russia. Who was going to get to the moon? Who was going to be first there? The most bitter conflict being fought up, fought out in the uh, outer hemisphere to see who could get first uh, to, the, to the moon and win what was called the space race. But for the last 30 years, something completely different has happened. We have what is called the International Space Station. We have 30 or so countries who are cooperating together, including Russia and America, in outer space with one International Space Station, supported by each of these countries, cooperating together with an American and Russian astronaut up there, despite all the hostilities and en enmity between the two countries on Earth, it has been possible to have this cooperation in the outer hemisphere. Quite amazing when you think of the space race that dominated the headlines for 30 years, to have had 30 years where it is not just the case that these countries are working together, but America cannot get its uh, spacemen to the space station without using Russian launchers, and Russians could not run that space station without the expertise that is exclusively held by the Americans. So it is a deep form of interdependence that has been possible even amongst the two most hostile powers of the second half, first, first half of the second half of the, cent of, of the century. And you keep saying to yourself, if we can find a way to cooperate in this most uh, difficult environment on one of the most sensitive of issues involving security as well as uh, discovery, if we can find a way to cooperate in the outer hemisphere, surely we can find a better way of cooperating on Earth. And we have got, therefore, to give people hope that something can be done. I uh, was lucky enough to know Nelson Mandela. And in his prison cell in uh, Robben Island, he had very few, very few um, uh, things that he could have on his prison wall or possessions that he could hold uh, because he was in solitary confinement for such a long period of time and the whole point of this was to demoralize him and to make him feel so isolated that he would give up. And he had one facsimile of a painting that's actually in the Tate Gallery in London. Very few possessions, but this was one of them. And it was a postcard, basically, of a painting, and the painting was called Hope. And you, it's strange, because when you actually look at this painting, and you can look at it on the internet, um, or at the Tate, the painting is of a young girl, blinded, trying to play a harp with broken strings. Impossible, you think. More like a painting that depicts desolation and hopelessness. A young girl, blind, could she ever play a harp that had broken strings? And of course, the point of the painting is, and this is what Mandela took out of it, even in the most hopeless situations, you've got to find a basis for hope. And Mandela, 27 years in prison, suffering tuberculosis, what, at one point in fear of being executed, seeing his own friends being executed week after week as a result of 
the South African policy of, of repression, Mandela, even in the most hopeless situations, never gave up hope. And we have got to convince people that no matter what the climate against international aid has been, and no matter how much nationalism and protectionism have come to dominate our international environment, that we can give people hope. And you know, hope is found in the 10,000 churches who today around this country, and I know I'm competing against them. <laughs> uh, and I know that there are many people uh, who are at church today who might uh, have been here. But hope is found in the 10,000 churches, 10,000 that are involved in Christian aid this week. Hope is found in the 50,000 people throughout our country who will be delivering these envelopes and picking up the money. Hope is to be found in Sierra Leone when we can see the difference that in a country with only a hundred or so doctors, the money that we can raise can make to saving mothers' lives and in turn saving infants' and children's lives as a result of it. Hope is to be found, obviously, in one of the most powerful texts in the Bible. Hope to rise like wings on, e uh, on eagles, to run and not be weary, to walk uh, and to never uh, be fatigued. That is a message of hope for the future. And we must use this Christian Aid Week to send that message out to the whole of the community that no matter what the criticisms of aid have been, that it is not them against us, it is not us putting the needs of people in this country as against the needs of people in other countries, that there is indeed a circle of empathy that links us from what happens here to what's happening right across the world and the people who are here and the people whom we can help in other parts of the world, and that Christian Aid and all the organizations that are doing so much good around the world need our support and should have our support this week. Thank you very much.